Hello everyone, I'm Gavin Omar Dixon and I'm the Managing Director for GovMed Solutions. GovMed Solutions is a consulting firm that assists health professionals such as doctors with product sourcing strategies as well as the starting and the managing of medical laboratories. Now, today I'd just like to talk to you about clinical chemistry and how it relates to diabetes and other carbohydrate disorders, diabetes mellitus. Okay, so I'm just going to show, show you the front page of the book that I'm using. This is clinical chemistry, a laboratory perspective. It's a book by Wendy Arnes and Jean Brickell. Quite an interesting book, copyright 2007. So yeah, so it's a clinical chemistry book. So they take a look at the table of contents right here. The overview of clinical chemistry, quality assessment, you have laboratory techniques and instrumentation, diabetes and other carbohydrate disorders, hemoglobin production, Disorders and testing, assessment of renal function, assessment of liver function. You have assessment of cardiovascular disorders to respiratory disorders, nutrition and digestive function, endocrine disorders and function, reproductive endocrinology, and fetal testing malignancy disorders and the therapeutic drug monitoring and toxicology so that's a table of contents which is basically what the book is all about so i'm just going to go into the overview of clinical chemistry to just give you an idea of what clinical chemistry is a clinical chemistry is a science a service and an industry as a science, clinical chemistry links the knowledge of general chemistry, organic chemistry, and biochemistry with the understanding of human physiology. So as a service, you know, the laboratory produces objective evidence from which medical decisions are made. In the industry aspect, it operates under the regulations that guide commerce in the United States. Yeah and provide the student with information about clinical chemistry as it relates to how they can gain knowledge about the correlation and assessment of human physiology and disease with the measurement of biochemical markers. Okay, so with this book, you have some side boxes in each chapter which provide common sense tips, definitions of terms. You have brief definitions of pathophysiology and clinical correlations, as well as reminders of the team approach in healthcare. Okay. Then move on a bit. Regulator guidelines, CLIA of 1988 so wave or oh, these are different wave tests and non-wave tests and your proficiency testing so the wave tests those are very simple are posed no reasonable risk of harm to the patient if the test is performed incorrectly so there's no really risk of harm to the patient if those tests are Perform incorrectly because they are very simple tests. You have non wave tests, which are complex tests that require skill to perform and interpret and are therefore regulated. Proficiency testing now that's a method of monitoring accurate outcome in which test samples from an external source are analyzed and results compared to those of reference laboratories and scored for accuracy so that's what proficiency testing is all about the more complicated the test the more stringent the requirements laboratories that perform non-wave testings are regulated under guidelines that cover 
quality standards for proficiency testing, patient test management, quality control, personal qualifications and quality assurance. The regulatory process is outcome oriented with PT, that's proficient testing, as the principal outcome measure. So that's some information you have there. Daily quality control, daily quality control. Well, let me start from this paragraph. Additionally, laboratories may be inspected for quality. The laboratory may be inspected for state regulatory agency. That's in the United States. In Jamaica, I guess you would have JANAC basically regulating the labs. So you'd have to check daily quality control and documentation of quality assessment are the key areas for inspection. CLIA 88 provides guidelines for both daily quality control and systemic quality assurance of the testing process from ordering test to reporting the test. Okay. So those are the safety regulations, you know, safety equipment, your glasses and goggles, your work, Shields, a gloves, coat, apron, fume hood, explosion proof, refrigerators, compressed gas storage, storage cabinets. Okay, so it also gives you a description of these personal protective equipment at the PPE. So you have unbreakable eye shields that surround the eye area, those are the glasses and goggles. And this is basically used to protect exposed skin and clothes that may be worn outside the laboratory. Okay. So that gives you some information about the personal protective aspects. So the clinical chemistry laboratory personnel must adhere to bloodborne pathogen safety protection procedures. Uh, minimum, at minimum, the manual should include this information, basic rules and procedures, chemical procurement, distribution and storage, environmental monitoring, housekeeping, maintenance and inspections. All of that information should be in the the whole safety regulations of the um, Medical lab. So you should have a, a safety manual with all of this information. Waste disposal requirements for training procedures and documentation of skills and accidents requirement, health hazards and medical treatment options. All of those. Then you know, we have a red ear. This is a safety diamond. Red ear is flammable. Blue ear is health related. Yellow area is reactivity, white area is for special dangers when the danger is special. So you have a team approach section over this side. You can read so I'm just moving on. Or oh, clinical chemistry is a science. So but there is basically the biochemistry of disease. So clinical chemistry lab measures change in biochemical compounds as an indicator of health status of disease processes. So the changes in biomedical markers related to health or disease. Based on the biochemical changes, you know, there are uniform in tests and organs in response to disease. The measurement of selected biomarkers can be used to monitor disease processes as they occur in specific living cell systems. So a biochemical marker is any biochemical compound, such as an antigen or antibody, abnormal enzyme or hormone that is sufficiently altered in a disease to serve as a aid in diagnosis are predicting susceptibility to the disease. And you have a definition of homeostasis here. It is a state of dynamic equilibrium of the internal environment of the body 
that is maintained by processes of feedback and regulation in response to external or internal changes. So the clinical, okay, so biochemical markers, you know, for instance, an increase in the concentration of urea and nitrogen in the blood may indicate kidney failure or increased concentration of blood cholesterol, you know, indicate increased risk of cardiac disorders, so, you know, you can get a heart attack or probably a stroke or anything like that. So carbohydrates, you're talking about your glucose, your fructose, your monosaccharides, galactose, all of those chemistry-related things. But that's that for the polysaccharides and all of those. So basically, carbohydrates is what diabetes is surrounded. The, the carbohydrate aspect of it. So I'm just going to jump. You see, you have the polysaccharides and um, disaccharides and um, monosaccharides. The digestion of dietary polysaccharides starts in the mouth with the catalysis of glycosidic bonds of the carbohydrate polymers by amylase. The disaccharides are produced by this reaction. Further digested in the duodenum. Disaccharides are split into monosaccharides by disaccharide enzymes such as lactase. Alright, so I'm going to jump to the um, diabetes, mellitus, and other carbohydrate disorders. So that's the diabetes and other. So yeah. So you see this chapter is about disaccharides. Explore the assessment and Metabolism of disaccharides, polysaccharides, and monosaccharides, other than glucose. You have disaccharides, which are the simple carbohydrates composed of two monosaccharides. You have the polysaccharides, which are the complex carbohydrates composed of more than 20 monosaccharides. So, diabetes mellitus is a Family, diabetes is a family of disorders that are characterized by hyperglycemia. Now, the disorders of diabetes differ in their etiology and symptoms and in the consequence of the disease. Okay. Timely specific therapeutic intervention may reduce the serious consequences of diabetes to aid in the a the physician by choosing appropriate therapy, the laboratory plays a role in diagnosis of the disease, identification of the type of the disorder, and assessment of progression of the tissue damage. Talking about insulin replacement here, diet management and exercise can reduce the consequences of type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is best controlled by weight loss, diet management, and drug therapy. Yeah, they have drug therapy such as metformin, which is a very popular one, and some other ones. Sulfonylureas, sulfonylureas. Yeah, those big words. So, Type 1 diabetes is characterized by a lack of insulin production and secretion by the beta cells of the pancreas. One cause of hyperglycine of type 1 diabetes mellitus is an autoimmune destruction of the beta cells of the pancreas. So the cell-mediated response causes infiltration of the pancreas and reduction in the volume of the beta cells. So this is basically autoimmunity taking place, the body attacking itself with antibodies from the immune system, resulting in type 1 diabetes. In the most insulin stimulates glucose uptake into cells and enhances glycogenesis. You have gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis. All that information. So type 2 diabetes now, which is an interesting one. Now is characterized by a decline in insulin action due to the resistance of the tissue cells to the action of insulin. So the problem is intensified by the inability of the beta cells of the pancreas to produce enough insulin to counteract 
the resistance does type 2 diabetes is a disorder of both insulin resistance and relative deficiency of insulin insulin resistance syndrome is also known as metabolic syndrome and syndrome X affects the metabolism of many nutrients including glucose triglycerides HDL high-density lipoprotein cholesterol individuals who are diagnosed with metabolic syndrome may show abnormal obesity and high blood pressure so here you have a idea of type 2 diabetes the etiology of type 2 diabetes is complex and multifaceted Factors such as lack of physical activity could be increase in age, hypertension, this, this lipidemia, racial ethnic groups, or even genetics can can cause these disorders. You know, you have gestational diabetes too, which is similar to the etiology of type two. It's basically diagnosed in pregnancy, diabetes that is diagnosed in pregnancy. So pregnancy is associated with increased tissue cell resistance to insulin. You see a lot of information is here. Protease inhibitor medication that inhibits the action of enzymes, ketoacidosis. That's the accumulation of ketoacids in the blood causing metabolic metabolic acidosis all right so i'm going to go back up a bit to where my polysaccharide information was lipids it has more lipids here and just, oh, I just want to go down a bit to where the chemistry has to do a lot with the endocrine system and the bone as you can see there yeah just moving on quality assessment versus quality control so the assurance of high quality laboratory results relies on a commitment to all aspects of the testing system including attention to pre-analytical, analytical, and post-analytical factors. The analytical phase includes verification of instrument linearity, precision, accuracy, and overall reliability through the use of standard materials, quality control samples, procedures, and QC rules. Management of high-quality laboratory testing must include the use of QC systems, which measure the variety of the analysis and consider also consider all the aspects of the process of laboratory testing prior to and after they have continuous quality improvement also the quality control sample that has sample with the matrix similar to the patient specimens with known concentration right. This is all about quality assessment, specimen transport, additives to blood, you know, analyte, acetone, alcohol, bilirubin, all of that information in this table is critical to the specimen handling in clinical chemistry. Oh, talking about standard deviation right here. quality control programs the goal of a well-defined quality control system is to detect immediate errors in an analytical run while minimizing the number of false rejections the simplest type of QC programs procedure uses one rule to reject the analysis based on QC results falling outside the range such as 95% if this is used 5% of the time a result that falls just outside of the 95% range would be false rejected so likewise 5% of the results are accepted within that range so this is all about qualitative and quantitative 
talking about proficiency testing as well. Adherence to a QC program with specific rules will help to achieve quality goals during routine laboratory operation. Medical decisions, the concentration or limit at which the test results are critically interpreted. That's the medical, and you have some information about proficiency testing there then, which is important to the QA and QC aspect of the medical lab, okay? So that's some information that should be helpful to you. I'm basically showing you a, a little glimpse of quality assessment, quality and control, and diabetes mellitus as it relates to clinical chemistry. So thank you so much for your time. If you need more information, you can Google Gavin Omar Dixon or GovMed Solutions. Thank you.